Hi, I'm Bree Dunn and I'm part of the community here at Image Church. Thanks so much for joining in with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, I want to invite you to text the word guest to the number on the screen so that someone can reach out this week. We're grateful to be able to provide these online services and resources for you, and we pray that God will use them to impact your life. Image family, we want to thank you for being a generous church. It's your generosity that fuels our ability to continue the mission of the gospel. If you plan on giving today, you can do so securely at imageatl.com give or through our Image Church app. We want to stay connected with you. I want to invite you to go to imageatl.com and click the Stay Connected button to sign up for our weekly update so you can be informed on everything that's happening here at Image Church. Also, I want to invite you to take a second to click the word subscribe to join in our Image Church YouTube page. Make sure you click the bell to get notifications each time we post new content. Thanks again for joining us today.
Hey guys, it's Jesse here. I just want to get on real quick uh, just to share a little bit of encouragement and share what God has um, been sharing with me in this season. Um, if I were to be honest, I would say that I've been experiencing just some wavering faith um, and trust in God here lately just because of everything that's going on, um, the, the health crisis, the civil unrest, the injustice, and um, on top of just personal things. And so um, God has really uh, pointed me to his word in, his, in Isaiah 26 and 3, where he says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you. And so he's really been showing me that um, I needed to shift my focus and my attention back to him. And when I do that, then he will begin to just provide peace that only I can get from him. And how do I do that? I do that by spending more time in the word. I pray more now than I ever have before. Um, I don't watch as much news just because it's devastating and disheartening sometimes. Um, and I just really spend dedicated time with God and I allow him to fill that space and I allow him to consume me um, with his presence and with his peace. And so I pray that that will be your prayer and be encouragement to you that as you navigate through throughout this season of your life and throughout life in general, um, that you will begin to um, place your focus and your attention and your affections back to God and allow him to direct your paths and allow him to overwhelm you with his presence and with his peace. Still into love 
in all of your ways, God. God, we declare that you are a good, good Father, and we thank you for that, God. We thank you, God, that even as we look back over our lives, God, and even as we look at our present situations right now, God, God, that we can honestly say and we can declare, God, that you are a good, good Father, God. You've been a present Father, God. God, you've been a very present help in a time of trouble, God. So we thank you for that, God, and we acknowledge that this morning, God. And so, God, help us to be reminded of that, God. God, when we lose sight, God, when we lose our way, God, even when we're in our sin, God, help us to remember that you're still a good father, God, that you come after us, God, God, and that you love us, God. God, your mercies are new every morning, and we thank you, God, for being a good, good father, God. God, we love you for that, God, and we just remind ourselves of that this morning. Hallelujah, God, we thank you. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways to us. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. family, we're so glad that you were able to join us this Sunday. As some of you may already know, we've started to roll out our regathering plans and starting July 19th, we'll start walking into phase two. We would love it if you could go to our website at imageatl.com and fill out a really quick hosting application form. We're looking to put together some house gatherings or watch parties where we can come together in groups of 10 to 12 so that we can practice safe social distancing and watch Sunday gatherings together. Be sure to stick around and visit our website for more information. Well, good morning, Image family and friends that are joining in with us this morning. I hope that you're doing well. Uh, listen, I just want to stop on the front end of this and acknowledge um, the reality that we've been in over the past several weeks. Um, they've been hard. Uh, they've been weighty. Um, and all of it's happened in the midst of, of COVID-19 and the craziness of that. And so uh, I just want to kind of hold up uh, something that you've probably already noticed, and that's the heightened reality of the brokenness um, that we live in, that our world is broken and we desperately need the hope of Christ in this world. And so it's now more than ever um, that we've got to be the church. It's now more than ever that we've got to prioritize the things that we've seen in the book of Philippians. We've got to prioritize unity. Uh, we've got to practice humility. And we've got to remember that in all of this, we have the answers to these things. We have the answers to these things because they're found in the hope of the gospel. And so as a church, we're called to model that for the world. Uh, we actually give a, a foretaste of that answer in the way that we interact with one another. And so I just want to encourage you to think through it that way as we continue to process and pray through all of this and um, really just ask the Lord um, for his grace and his kindness uh, for us to be able to uh, do this in a way that's most loving and in a way that points the world to the hope found in Christ. And so I just want to pray to that end, just start a little bit different this morning and just uh, start with just kind of praying for our, our nation and our world in the midst of uh, everything that we've been facing, everything we've been going through. And so family, just ask you to bow your heads with me and let's take this before the Lord. 
God, we love you and we acknowledge that we live in a broken world. It's, it's so evident in everything that we've been experiencing that we, we desperately need um, something beyond this world, that we need a hope beyond this world. And God, as Christians, we know that that hope is Christ and that Jesus came and he lived and he died to reconcile us back to you uh, so that um, we would be saved from the broken realities of this world and we would have hope for all of eternity. God, I pray that we would believe that, that we would embody that. I pray that we would uh, practice unity, um, unity that's found in Christ, that we would practice humility, humility that's found in Christ. And God, that as a church, we would model for our city and even for the world uh, what it looks like uh, to be able to navigate these issues in light of who Christ has made us and what he's called us to. And so, God, we lay these things at your feet. We lay the, the broken realities of, uh, of our systems and the injustices and, uh, God, uh, the, the, the oppression. Um, Lord, we lay the, the disease, uh, COVID-19, at your feet. And, um, God, we just ask that you be sovereign over all of this, that you work in all of this. And God, we, we, don't, have, um, we don't have solutions to, to fix COVID and to, uh, to bring healing, but you do. And so God, we, we come before you as the great healer. God is the one who's promised to restore all things. And um, God, we just ask you to work and move in the midst of all of this. And as a church, we would take a step forward that we wouldn't run from the tension, but that we would run into the tension as we point people to the hope of the gospel. And God, we just, we need you. We need you as a church. We need you as a city. We need you as a nation. And so, God, we cry out to you on behalf of your faithfulness and ask that you would work in this season, that you would be glorified, the gospel would be preached, and that your church would advance in the ministry and message of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the ways that we want to respond in the midst of everything that's going on um, in our nation, in our world, is uh, we want to we want to launch something called the Love Your Neighbor Movement. We want to put feet to the mission and the ministry, and we want to do this in a very tangible and real way. But one of the things we've said is in the midst of COVID-19, the methods may change, but the mission hasn't. And so we want to put feet to uh, the mission that we're called to uh, through this Love Your Neighbor movement that we want to launch. And so we've put together a framework for how we can love our, our neighbors. And for us, it's going to give us a footprint, uh, yes, in the midst of COVID-19, but even beyond that, a footprint for what it looks like to actually engage with uh, our neighbors and engage for the sake of the gospel. And so stay on the lookout for more information about that. I'm really excited about this. This is kind of a monumental time in life of our church as we launch this uh, movement to really love our, our neighbors, our city, uh, and even to the nations. And so you can also go to imageatl.com slash L-Y-N. That stands for love your neighbor in case you didn't know that. And uh, go there and find out more details. We've put a page together with a lot of information. We're going to be rolling out more details to come. We're going to have some specific emphases that we're going to be putting on things this summer. And we're going to give you very tangible tools that you can use and put into practice right now, even in the midst of COVID-19, in ways that you can continue uh, the mission and ministry of the gospel. And y'all, that's what we want to be about. We want to run into the tension, not away from it. And so uh, this this new initiative, this new opportunity for us is going to give us a footprint that we're going to run in for a really, really long time. So be excited about that and be looking. Uh, well, in 1989, the Tour de France had an incredible uh, finish. Really, it's one for the record books. It's one that will go down in all of, of history. Um, they were coming to the final stage of the race, and there was a guy named Greg LeMond who was 50 seconds behind a Frenchman named Fignon. And there's no way that anybody believed um, that Greg LeMond could ever catch that 50 seconds in the last stage of the race. It was a time trial. It was near impossible. In fact, the French newspaper had already planned on Fignon uh, winning this thing. They did a special edition. His picture was already on the front page of the newspaper. Everybody was getting ready to celebrate. And they come to the last stage of the race. And Greg LeMond does something really interesting. He says, listen, I don't want any radio contact. So there's radio contact they have that lets them know about the race and their time and all these different things. And Greg LeMond says, I don't want to know anything about the radio at all. I don't want to hear anything about that. I just want to focus on one thing, and that's the finish line and the prize that awaits me. Uh, meanwhile, Fignon decided to do the exact opposite. He wanted all the radio information that he could possibly get. So that was his method, and Greg LeMond takes another method. And Greg LeMond busts his tail and pedals incredibly fast, lays it all out on the line, and he ends up winning by eight seconds. And it was the fastest stage of the race that's ever been won, and it's the closest time window uh, it, that, that's ever been uh, won before. So eight seconds is the closest time window of any victory in the Tour de France. And so Greg LeMond won that thing. And it's incredible as we look back on that and say, man, that's amazing. And, and a lot of people credit it back to the fact that he says, I don't want any, any radio information. I just want to lock in and focus on the finish line and the prize that awaits me. 
You say, well, why do you share that with me? Well, it's because Paul's going to give us a picture of something similar to that today in our text. See, in the same way that Greg LeMond removed any and all distractions so that he could focus on the finish line and the prize, Paul's going to call us to remove any distractions that keep us from looking at the finish line and the prize as well. And that prize is Jesus, right? You have to wonder, as you look back on the, the 1989 Tour de France, if one of the contributing factors to Fignon's loss was the fact that he was all about the radio information. You have to wonder if maybe he was distracted by Greg LeMond and the fact that Greg LeMond was catching him and maybe he burned himself out or maybe he got uh, conflicted or frustrated and it caused him not to be as well. You have to wonder if that's the case. And so many times for us, what happens is we become distracted by so many different things. Either we're looking over our shoulder or we listen to radio noise in our, our life and we miss uh, the finish line and we forget about the prize. Right, last week, we talked about how the gospel changes everything for us and how the call of Christianity is a, is a radical call for us to where we consider everything a loss compared to Jesus, right? that he's the one thing that defines everything, that we spend our li- lives running after him at all cost. And for many of us, the reason why this is so difficult is because we get so easily distracted. We get so easily distracted, right? We're, we're hearing too much chatter from other people. We're comparing ourselves. We're looking over our shoulder at past victories or failures or all of these different things. So we get distracted from the finish line and the prize, which is Christ. And so Paul's going to show us, and he's going to speak to this very specifically and show us what kind of posture we should assume so that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, fixed on the finish line, right? That's what it's all about. So let's jump in, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, all right? I'm going to start in verse 10, because here's where we finished last week, and this is going to set up our text for this week. In verse 10, he says this. He says, my goal, so Paul's declaring his goal here in verse 10, my goal is to know him, talking about Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed in his, uh, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Now he's going to continue that flow of thought here in verse 12, and he says this, Not that I've already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I've also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. All right, so... Here's the deal. I want to give you two truths, two truths that'll keep us from getting distracted in the Christian life so that we can say with Paul, I consider all things a loss compared to Christ. Okay, here's the first truth that I want to give you, and that's this. The Christian life's not a lazy river, it's a race. The Christian life's not a lazy river, it's a race. Let's talk about a lazy river for just a little bit. I'm sure you guys have been to Great Wolf Lodge or you've been to some kind of water park at some point. What happens in a lazy river? Well, there's no goal, there's no prize, and there's no finish line. Ain't nobody worried about how fast they can get around the lazy river. It's the exact opposite. Let me get in here, get comfortable, kind of lay back, put my head back, and just enjoy the ride, right? And so for many of us, when we look at the Christian life, that's kind of what we think about the Christian life. Man, this is something for my convenience and my comfort. I'm just going to kind of get in and I'm just going to enjoy life as, uh, you know, being a Christian. And we're just going to kind of move along the, the, lazy, la- the lazy river. And what happens is we get distracted and, and we think, man, I, I love uh, the comforts that Christianity extends to me. Uh, I love the warm bubblies that I feel. I, I love being able to affiliate with Christianity. And yet, when you look at the Bible, we see that that's not at all what the Christian life's about. It's not about making you more comfort, comfortable and being more convenient for you. It's the exact opposite. So here's what Paul's saying about the Christian life and what it should look like. He's saying it's like a race, right? What's a race? Well, you, you train for it. You, you strain in it. Uh, you give all you have. Uh, you're running for the finish line, and you have your eyes on the prize, right? Paul says, I make every effort. I reach forward. I pursue my goal. So you see all of this, this straining, this, this effort, this desire to run after the prize that awaits at the finish line, right? Paul is, is fighting to run the race. He's fighting to run the race. And, and let me just say this, that's so encouraging to me. It's so encouraging because I'm like, man, if Paul's fighting, it means that he hasn't arrived yet. It's not like Paul's this perfect figure that's out there floating and it's like, oh, we could never be like Paul. Paul's saying right here, I'm, I'm fighting, I'm straining, I'm reaching for, I desire these things. And so it's encouraging to sit here and see, man, Paul didn't have it all together. He didn't have it all together, but he's running after the one who does and who did for him in his place. And his name is Jesus. And Paul's saying that's what everything's about. Here's another part of this thing, right? 
If Paul's fighting and grinding to run the race of Christianity, then my question is how much more then do we need to fight and grind in the race of Christianity? Right? When we look at Paul and we see him, we're like, man, he's a hero of the faith. If that dude's fighting, how much more do I need to be fighting in my own life? How much more do I need to be grinding toward this race? And, and listen, here's the deal. He's not running for his salvation. He's running because he's been saved. Right? He's not running to achieve salvation. He's running because of his salvation. He recognizes what Jesus has done for him, and it compels him to run after Jesus. After everything Jesus has done for Paul, it makes Paul want to run after Jesus, right? He's working out his salvation. He's, he's living out his salvation. We've talked about this. He's living in light of what? A future reality. He's pointing to a future hope that's found in Christ, a future prize, right? Somebody who's waiting at the finish line, and his name is Jesus, Right? And the caliber of the prize, oftentimes, the thing we have to understand is the caliber of the prize in anything always dictates our efforts. Right? Let, me, let me say that again because this is really important. The caliber of the prize always dictates our efforts, no matter what in life. Think about it like this. Um, if the prize is a promotion, if the prize is a bonus, if the prize is a new job, if the prize is more money, whatever the case may be, however great the prize is, it just determines and dictates the efforts in which we give toward that prize. And so what happens a lot of times is in our lives, we tend to run after the prizes of this world more than we do the prize of Christ. See, what we do is we recognize the caliber of the prizes that are offered in this life, and we allow those temporary earthly prizes to dictate our life more than we allow Christ to dictate our life. The question is why? Why? Well, we like it because it's short-term gratification, right? The prizes that we get in this life, the short-term prizes that we get in this life are, in a lot of ways, instant gratification, right? You know, money or a bonus or a new position or popularity or fame, whatever the case may be, they're kind of instantaneous. And we like that. We desire that. And so the world holds those things up. We're like, man, I really want that. This is better for me. This is going to make my life better. And so I want those things. And what happens when we do that is we actually don't believe that Jesus is better. We feel like that these other things, these temporary prizes in this life, actually are better than Jesus. And so we allow those things to dictate us more than we allow Christ to dictate us. See, what we see in Paul's life is that he knew exactly what the prize was, and he knew that everything else paled in comparison to the prize, that which is Jesus Christ, who's standing at the finish line. I I love the the picture, a vivid picture that Paul paints in this of Jesus is the one awaiting, right? It's not this like, like floating afterlife that that we just are this ambiguous kind of, you know, touchy feely angel wing deal. It's like, no, no, no. When you finish this life, Jesus awaits you for those that are in Christ. And man, that's so encouraging, such a powerful picture. So for Paul, we see that he knew what the prize was. He knew it was Jesus, right? That at the end of his life, he didn't want temporary earthly prizes that would not Uh, be able to go with him when he dies, he wanted the eternal prize that would last forever, and it was Jesus. My question for you is this. Do you know the prize? Do you know the prize that you're running after? Is the prize that you're running after Jesus, or is it a temporary earthly prize that won't actually last and will never satisfy you and can't actually give you what you ultimately want? Do you know the prize? What prize are you running after? Right? Or like Paul, can you say, man, I know the prize. I know the prize is Christ. And for some of you, you've just forgotten the magnitude of the prize, right? You've forgotten the gospel. You failed to believe in the goodness of the gospel. The gospel is no longer great to you, and so you gravitate to the things of this world, and you begin running after those things. You've forgotten um, that, that Jesus came, and he lived in your place, and he died in your place, and he rose from the dead to give you hope of new life and eternity with God forever. Restoration from the brokenness of this world. We talked about at the beginning, the broken realities we're experiencing Jesus came, lived, and died, and rose from the dead to give you a chance, an opportunity to be alleviated from this brokenness, to escape this brokenness, for Christ to restore all things, and you to get to be a part of that. So do you understand the magnitude of the gospel, the prize that awaits you, which is Christ Jesus, right? See, when you understand the prize, when you understand what you get, then everything in your life becomes about that prize. Let me give you an example. Think about the Olympics, right? When somebody finally makes it to the Olympics and they're going to represent America and they're going to be a part of the Olympics, they know what's at stake and it's a little medal and it's gold and everybody wants it. And they're willing to do whatever it takes in order to get that medal. They revolve their entire life. They quit their jobs. 
they move to different places, and they do everything they possibly can to equip themselves to be able to achieve that specific prize. They want that gold medal. That's what they're after, and their entire life is dictated by that specific prize. See, when we understand that the prize for us as Christians is Jesus, that it means we're willing to do whatever it takes to make him the center of our life, that our lives now revolve around him, that we recognize who he is and what he offers us, right? We, we know what the prize is, that we get Christ, should we continue in the faith? And so for us, we go, man, we want to continue in the faith. We want to continue to believe the gospel, right? It means that, that we're willing to orient our lives around everything and anything that keeps us focused on Jesus, right? If faith is what allows us to endure to the end, that's faith in the finished work of Jesus allows us to endure in the end and be able to receive the prize of Christ. And we want to continue to walk in faith, believing in the finished work of Jesus, which means we orient ourselves around everything that points us to that end, right? It means we dive into the word of God because what does it do? It orients us around the truths of God, the realities of Christ and the, the future hope that's found in him. It means we devote ourselves to, uh, to a local body, right? A church that's going to encourage us in this, that's going to spur us on in this, that's going to preach the gospel, that's going to point us to the gospel, that's going to be a safe haven when we fall to sin and point us back to Jesus. It means that we're going to serve and we're going to give and we're going to follow and run after Jesus. Why? Because all those things keep us oriented around Christ. We're repositioning ourselves around the prize. And his name is Jesus, right? Running after Jesus, running after Jesus, that's the goal. And, and it's not, let me just, I, I want to say this again because I know it's so easy to, to, to think this. It's not running after Jesus for salvation. Okay, it's running after Jesus because we have salvation. Because of what we've experienced in Christ, it compels us to run. It compels us to do that. Think, think about it like this. If somebody told me as a, as a college baseball player, hey man, I just want you to know no matter what, you're going to be a first round draft pick for the Atlanta Braves. Let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to quit working. I'm not going to be like, man, I got it made. <laughs> I'm not going to swing a bat. I'm not going to throw a ball. I'm just going to show up because I know I'm going to be a first round pick for the Atlanta Blazers. Who cares? No, no, I'm going to bust my tail because I'm like, man, I know what's coming. I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to be a first round pick, man. I'm going to, I can't wait to get to that moment. When I get there, man, it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to love that. And I'm going to be able to leverage to get, it's gonna, it changes everything, right? It doesn't mean that I go, well, who cares? It means the exact opposite that I press in and press on even more. Right? Do you see the Christian life as a race? A race where Christ, Jesus, is waiting for you at the end to welcome you in and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He's waiting on you. In the hope of that, when I think about the realities that we're experiencing now in this world, how broken and sick and twisted things are, and then I think about Jesus, the one who gave his life for me, that shed his blood for me, that took on the cross for me, that he's waiting on me at the end, and he says, hey, guess what? This is the worst it's ever going to be for you, that only greatness awaits and goodness awaits because you get God. You get the full experience of being with God forever. I mean, when I think about that, when everything that's going on right now is going on, what an incredible hope. That's something I want to run after. That's something that makes me want to run after Jesus. What happens is we forget that and we begin to see the, the things of this world and we think, man, we really want to run after this because, man, it would make life more comfortable. It would make life a whole lot more like a lazy river. And what happens? We become distracted. We become distracted. Distracted from the main thing, and that's saying everything is a loss compared to Christ because Christ is the one that awaits me at the end. I want Jesus more than anything. Don't get distracted on those things, right? Some of us need to get off the raft and we need to get in the race. We need to start running after Jesus. We need to reorient ourselves, remind ourselves, whoa, wait a minute. Man, I've been running after the wrong prize because the prize I have is one from Dollar General and it ain't going to last, right? I need one that's going to last forever. So some of you got to get off the raft and get in the race and you need to stop expecting that, you know, somehow some of you, you're walking in the Christian life and you're like, man, I just don't get it. I don't see changes in my life and I don't see things happening in my life. And it's because you've been on a raft, just expecting that somehow it's just going to kind of magically happen and you negate all the tools that God's given you to orient yourself around him. And when you orient yourself around him, he's the one that brings the change in your life, right? For some of you, it means getting more involved with the church. That means jumping into stuff like the Love Your Neighbor movement. It, like, it means participating in your community group. It means engaging with the people in your community group. It means making the weekend a priority, even though it's weird. I know it's weird. You're watching me on TV right now. I get it. It's weird. But we need this. Right? We need to hear the word of God. We need to sit together as the people of God. We're all doing the same thing right now in one capacity or another. 
We're leveraging the, the opportunity that God's given us through this. And so some of you need to get involved with the church. That's a tool that God's given you to orient yourself around him that brings the change in your life. Others of you need to continue to, to dive into the word. You need to start diving into the word. You need to start learning more about who God is so you can declare the truths of God in the midst of your circumstances to remind you and reorient you around who he is. Right? Or in the sins in your, your life that you're struggling with, you need to go to the word of God and remind yourself of who he is. You need to start praying. That's another tool that God's given you. Dive into prayer and recognize that God has given you a direct power source, a direct line of communication through prayer. You get the chance to talk to the God that made you, that knows you better than anybody, that can control the wind and the waves and the circumstances and everything that we have. Lean into prayer. Lean into that tool that God's given us and then trust the power of the Spirit inside of you. I love the fact that Jesus, or that Paul says in here that Jesus has taken hold of him. Right? You see the, the, how he always wraps it in this. So Paul calls you to something and then reminds you that God's given you the power to be able to do it. Right? We have the power of the Spirit inside of us, and so some of us need to start walking in that. We've got to stop viewing the Christian life as a lazy river, and we've got to start viewing it as a, a race that God's given us. God saved us to the race, and he's actually given us the ability to run in the race. So get off the raft and jump into the race and start remembering the prize and run after Jesus. All right? Orient your eyes around that prize. Here's the second truth that'll keep you from getting distracted. Here it is. Stop looking over your shoulder at things of the past. Stop looking over your shoulder at the things of the past. And this is kind of two-pronged that I want to hold up for you, right? This is kind of how I want to couch this. Everything that hinders your faith and obedience, everything that hinders your faith and obedience, you need to forget those things. Everything that hinders your faith and obedience, you need to forget those things. What do I mean by that? Well, it could be pride of the past, We see this with what's tethered to what Paul's saying. Remember, he just talked about his resume not long ago. He's talking about, I'm forgetting about those things. My resume, the things that I thought once qualified me, the things that I thought I could find pride in, the things that I thought would qualify me or or justify me, they actually don't. I'm forgetting about those things. So for some of you, this means that maybe you've done something good for God. Maybe there's been something really great that you've done or maybe you feel really good about a certain area. You need to forget about that. You need to forget about that. Right? That's the pride of the past, and you don't need that. That's going to distract you. That's going to be a distraction. It's going to pull you away from trusting in, in, your, in, uh, trusting in Christ and having faith, and it's going to pull you away from walking in obedience. Because what that does is it takes your eyes off of Christ and puts them onto yourself. You're all of a sudden, you're looking in a mirror because you're like, man, look what I did. This is awesome. You know, I'm really good at this, or I'm really good at that, or man, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited because I was able to do this. And, and you find yourself boasting in the past works that you've done as opposed to looking to Christ, all right? So, so again, we're talking about forgetting anything that hinders your, your faith or your obedience. And we've talked about the pride of the past. Here's another part, the guilt of something of the past. The guilt of something of the past. This is a big one for a lot of people. Let me just caveat this really quickly. There's a difference between conviction and guilt. Conviction drives you to the cross. Guilt keeps you from it. All right, so what happens is, is for many of us, we have a sin in the past, something we've done that we think is catastrophic and it's, it's horrible and it is, and that's fine, I, I hear that. But we hold on to that, which is not believing and remembering the gospel. We're wallowing in our guilt, basically saying, hey, Jesus, your blood wasn't significant enough to be able to cover this past sin. And so we hold on to this guilt and, and it hinders us from our faith in Christ because we're not looking to him and his finished work. We're actually, we're going back to legalism and saying, man, I really dropped the ball back here in some capacity, no matter how big it is, and so I'm held bondage because of that area that I dropped the ball in my life. So some of us, we have things in our, in our past that we're holding on to that are making us feel guilty and it's hindering our faith and our obedience, right? It's, it's, it's a distraction from the prize of Christ because we're either looking at something that we're prideful in or we're looking at something that we're shameful of. And so I, I just want you to take a second and I want you to think through two of these things. And I want to ask you this question. Let me start with the first one. What is the most recent thing that you did that you're gloating in right now? What is the most recent thing that you did that you're gloating in right now, that you're most excited about or most prideful about? You may not see it as pride, but what is it that you're patting yourself on the back for? Really think about it. If you got a pen, jot it down or just make a mental note of that. And just think about that for just a second. Here's what I want to say to that, whatever that is. You need to know that that is a distraction that's pulling you away from faith in Jesus and putting, it, putting you in a place where you're having faith in yourself and your previous works. It's taking your eyes off of following Jesus in obedience and onto the works that you've accomplished. 
that it is a distraction. And it's one of the reasons why you're not able to say everything's a loss compared to the surpassing knowledge of Christ, that everything is a loss. No, because you're still holding on to that pride of the past, to that good thing that you did, the thing that you're gloating in. So write a line through that. If you wrote it down, draw a line through that. Draw a line right through the middle of that and say, does it matter? Does it matter? Here's the second question I have for you. What's the thing that you feel most guilty about? This is the biggest one. Most people struggle with this one. What's the thing that you feel most guilty about? Really and truly. Everybody has skeletons in their closet. Everybody has a dark past. What is it that's in your past? What are you most ashamed of? What's the thing that that the enemy tends to bring to your mind to make you feel guilty in moments where you're about to step forward in faith? What is that specific thing? Write it down. Just take a second and write it down or make a mental note. Type it in your phone. Here's what you need to understand. Whatever it is that you wrote down, for some of you, maybe four or five things. Whatever it is that you wrote down, that's a distraction. That's a distraction from the prize. Whatever it is that you wrote down, you're saying when you hold on to that, Jesus, your death wasn't significant enough for that specific sin. Jesus, your work wasn't good enough. Your blood wasn't good enough. Your perfect life wasn't good enough. You need to understand the the realities of what you're saying when you grab hold of something and hang on to guilt. See, the gospel is that no matter how bad you've been or no matter what you've done, that Jesus gives you his perfection and he takes on your punishment and he raises from the dead and then gives you new life, which means that there's no identity in the past successes and there's no identity in the past failures. There's only identity in Christ that he now is the thing that characterizes your life. And because he characterizes your life, he's the one that you're running after because he's the one that you get in the end. Anything outside of that is a distraction. My fear is is that we live in a world where it's so easy for us to get distracted either by the comforts of this life or the fake prizes from Dollar General that this world holds up through our, our careers or our jobs or through money or whatever other toys and trinkets that our world says that you need to have. We get so easily distracted. Or we get distracted by the good things that we've done in the past. Or we get distracted by the bad things that we've done. And the minute we get ready to take a step of faith or we get ready to walk in obedience, all of a sudden we get guilt stricken. We're like, oh man, I'm I'm not worthy. I'm not not capable enough. I'm not qualified to be able to walk in that. I'll just tell you, one of the things that I do every single time before I preach is I remind myself that I am not worthy and I am not capable on my own, but that through Christ, I am worthy and I am capable. Some of you need to grab hold of that, begin walking in faith and you need to forget anything that hinders your faith and your obedience so easily get lured away here's what i want to leave you with all right what i want to challenge you to do i've told you everything that you need to lay aside i've told you about the distractions the things that pull you away from remembering the prize i I now want to give you something to lay hold of and that's what i want to leave you with something to lay hold of i want to challenge you to remember everything that serves your faith and your obedience I want you to remember everything that serves your faith and obedience. What I mean by that? Well, maybe there was a sin that you were saved from, a a sin that was really bad, something that you did feel really guilty for, but you've remembered and believed the gospel and the fact that Jesus bled to forgive you and free you from that sin. And so maybe it is your wicked and sinful past that drives you forward in your faith. Then remember those things and allow it to reorient your eyes back toward Jesus let it make you run toward Jesus. Maybe there's been a, a triumph of grace in your life in some capacity. You've overcome something or God has healed you from something or God has gifted you something in your life or God has worked in a very specific way. Remember that. Remember that and allow it to spring you forward in faith and obedience, in faith and obedience. What is it? Where is it that God's worked in your life the most? Some very significant areas, maybe saved you from certain sins that you really remember, that you're like, man, I was here and and God's brought me here and that's something to propel you. Remember that. Maybe it's something incredible God's done. Remember that. The goal is faith and obedience. And so lay hold of the things that God has done in your life that drives you toward that end. And don't get distracted by other things in this life. Keep your eyes on the prize because I promise you, I promise you that Jesus is everything that you want. He's everything that you need. 
He's everything that you could ever ask for. And in him, you can find all the things that you ultimately want that nothing in this world ever satisfies. And some of you need to hear that. And others of you need to recognize that you have been distracted. And the reason why last week hit hard and you're like, man, I really can't say everything's a loss compared to Christ is because you're distracted by either comforts of this world, past successes or past sins in your life. And you need to reorient and refocus your eyes back toward Jesus and what he's done for you. And some of you need to trust in Jesus for the very first time. That you're just in bondage right now to the comforts of this world and the things of the past. And you need to trust in the finished work of Jesus, that he came and did everything necessary to save you. And he gave you his perfection. And he died in your place. And he rose from the dead so that you could have hope of eternity with God forever. That your relationship with God that was once severed has now been made right by the finished work of Jesus. And that yes, even though we live in brokenness, that this is not the end. That there's something so much greater than this that's promised through the finished work of Jesus. Would we remember that? Would we see Christ as a prize? And would we run with every ounce of energy that we have for the sake of him who saved us, who gave his life for us? Let me pray for us. God, we love you. And we recognize this is hard because we're a people that gets distracted so easily. Would you help us to be able to focus our eyes on you? And would you give us the boldness and courage to take steps of faith and obedience? And God, would you be the center of our life? And would you be what we run after the hardest? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of 150 psalms written, it's difficult for me to choose just one or two that have impacted my life because each one is significant for the glory of God. And also, there have been many that have been soothing to my heart and soul. When I'm sad and I feel alone, Psalm 42 reminds me to speak to my downcast soul. When I run out of words of praise, Psalm 145 reminds me of the wonderful attributes of God. In a world that's full of hatred and unexplainable viruses that keep us away from each other, violence and racism, it's hard not to feel the weight of that. And it's even harder to praise a God that seems so far away. But then I opened the beautiful book of Psalms filled with prayers of adoration and thanks, cries for help and anguish and pleas for forgiveness, mercy and justice and emotions that I have pretty much felt time and time again and then I remember what a mighty God I serve this culture this culture today the chaos the conflict the confusion the opposition the things that are going on around us the way that we function as a church is by pursuing love at all costs it's by using the gifts that God's given us for the purpose of serving other people. And it's by being about God's glory. our lives down because he's laid his life down for us we want to thank you for joining us online today we hope you were encouraged in your faith and challenged to grow deeper in your walk with God through the message this morning if you responded to the gospel today or if you have any questions or would like to take next steps to get connected we want to follow up with you just text the word connect to the number on the screen and someone will be in touch with you soon if you are in need of help or you would like some additional resources during this time, we're here for you. Please visit our page at imageatl.com. If you have been blessed by any of our online resources, please consider giving to continue supporting the ministries of Image Church. You can give through the Image Church app or at imageatl.com give. 
We were not created to walk through life alone. We need each other. Our community groups are places where we learn, laugh, and live as a family. These groups remind us that we aren't alone and we are better together. All of our groups are now meeting virtually and we would love for you to get connected. You can do that at imageatl.com slash community group. Make sure to follow us on social media and we look forward to our next virtual gathering.